So I haven't, so we've got lots of feedback about how the presentations have been going. So we made some changes. So on the agenda, for each agenda item in parentheses is a number. And that's how long the speaker is supposed to speak. So I, I would like a volunteer to kind of keep track of time and raise, raise their hand when there's two minutes left in the time box. So, okay, Michael Tier. Awesome. Okay. No, just the agenda. Okay. okay, are we ready, Chris? All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the February Fort Worth Astronomical Society general meeting. Um, we, we have quite a group here today in house, and how many do you reckon we have online, Chris? More than two. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there, uh, hopefully you saw something a little different when you came in today. Um, we had uh, what we're going to start doing, and we got started late today, but we got lots of responses. So, we created a presentation um, of images that folks have taken in the last month. And it can be terrestrial, it can be anything. And there were some wonderful images today that we got from uh, lots of folks. Deep sky images, uh, the moon, comet, uh, terrestrial images of uh, the northern lights. It was very nice. So we want to do that every month. And um, so uh, hopefully everybody can participate in that. The idea is to have something up on the board while we're getting organized uh, to begin with. So, again, welcome. My name is Bob Circus. I'm the president of the club. And uh, we're, we're trying something a little different. We're going to have the agenda posted. Right now, it's going to be on this wall over here to my left. Um, but uh, beginning next month, hopefully, we'll have it on that front wall there. So, again, um, the format is a little different. and. Uh, we hope you guys, uh, we, we want feedback, so you can catch us after the meeting and tell, tell, me, tell us what you liked, you didn't like, you can send an email to the board. Um, it's, we're just trying to get this uh, to run a little better and uh, more productively. So can we go to the agenda, please? No. Okay, so t today, um, we, of course, have our, our welcome, Bill Hall, who is our new vice president. Table rumble for Bill Hall. He's going to give us our, his weekly or his monthly report on what's in the sky for the next month. Then we're going to have uh, monthly reports from Outreach. That's uh, Pat, Patrick, ba Patrick McVann back there, the Rising Star Development Committee. Uh, Michelle, um, Palo Pinto State Park, Par uh, Palo Pinto Mountain State Park. Thank you, uh, Tom Roth. Is he online? I don't see him here. Okay. Okay, and I don't think there's anything to report today. Okay. Okay, and then Michelle will give the report there. Uh, announcements. Um, votes. We're, We're not going to have any formal votes today. today. Uh, we'll, we'll have, have a break, break. and then, then I'm going to give a presentation on Messier, the man, the myth, and the, and the marathon. marathon. Uh, uh, then, then we'll, we'll have another break. break. Then, then we'll, we'll have, have the the uh, uh, monthly raffle, raffle which is, is always interesting. interesting. And, and then, then we're, we're going to have our business meeting, meeting. and then we're going to close up and go have beer. Except, Except for, for those, those people, people that are remote. remote. They're not, not going to be able to participate in that activity. So uh, one, one of the drawbacks of um, being remote, remote, I guess. So, so again, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for being here. here. Next, Next slide, please. please.
Okay, we're going to welcome our, our new members today. If you're here, please raise your hand. Uh, Constantine Bakintas. Perfect. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. And it's important for me to get names right because with a last name spelled S I R K I S. Yes. And then the Allen Browning family. Welcome. Do we have any visitors here tonight? Okay. Anybody raising their hand being visitors online? Okay. Awesome. So your executive board. So something to note here. Um, Every position is filled. And that's, that's a first time in a long time. So as I mentioned, Bill Hall, I'm, I'm Bob Circus. Okay, I'm leading this three ring thing here today. Uh, Bill Hall is our president, our vice president, excuse me. Freudian slip maybe, okay. Uh, John Jomini is our treasurer. He's our esteemed treasurer. We like John a lot. He's made threats of retiring. We need to work on that. Okay. Monica Merritt is our secretary. She's back there. Does an outstanding job. Phil Stage is our one of our directors and chief badge maker. Jack of all trades, master of none. So. And then Robert Cargill is another director. He's in the back there. Bruce Campbell. Congratulations, Bruce. He's one of he's a new director. We he just joined the group uh, yesterday. So Zach Smith is not here today, and uh, he's a director. And our legal beagle, Cy Simonson. So. He's, he's going to be prominent in discussions later this evening. So that's your board. And then the next slide, please. Oh, can we go back one? Please notice, we, we, we're, um, I, I sent some emails out last couple of weeks. We are now on Google Workplace uh, at fortworthastro.com. Um, it's free because we're a nonprofit. So you'll more and more start seeing emails that are coming from fortworthastro.com. So don't make sure you unspam them. So there's everybody's email there. Thank you. So some key contacts, I'll go over them very quickly. Uh, the development committee, Rising Star Development at fortworthastro.com. Uh, Michelle Thiessen, uh, Tom Roth, who's ill, Robin Pond, who is, um, selling uh, Rising Star raffle tickets. Um, Zach Smith, who's not here. Robert Cargill in the back there. Uh, Shane Griffith, who is out looking for a job. He just graduated college and he's trying to get work with Burlington Northern. Uh, Bruce Campbell, uh, and Bruce Campbell has another important role. He's in charge of maintaining the uh, Rising Star grounds. Um, Tom Roth is Palo Pinto Mountain State Park. He's our representative there. Then we have uh, Thompson Observatory, which is um, in Keene, Texas. It's part of the Southwest Adventist University. We have pretty much unfettered access. Uh, I think we'll talk about that next month, more details. So if you want to go, please contact me. Um, and then I'll, I'll make the arrangements for you. It's maybe 40 minutes max from here. It's very easy to get to. And then um, we have a new uh, webmaster, George Lutch. Um, we are moving from uh, our current web hosting to Google Sites, and he's going to chat about that a little later. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's who we are and pretty much what we do. Thank you. Um, so we were founded in 1949, one of the oldest astronomy clubs in the country. Uh, we have, as of today, we have 182 members. So we're growing every, every day, it seems like. We have a wide range of 
things that we do from observational to imaging to building telescopes to all kinds of stuff. So if you have questions, shoot an email to our e-groups. Uh, any, anybody here, there's no dumb question. If you have a question, ask. Everybody here will try and answer and, and try and help. That's one of the greatest things about this club. We have a lot of knowledge and uh, everybody is willing to share. And um, uh, we're a nonprofit organization, so we accept any and all donations. Thank you. Next, please. Bill Hall is going to give us um, a chat about what's in the sky. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Huh? Hmm? Speak up. Used to? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I'll just speak up. <laughs> Hi. So we're going to talk about space stuff. I'm going to turn the lights off. Don't get me wrong. As much as I love discussing compost technology, I like talking about space stuff better. So this is what's going on in the sky from tonight until March 21st, which is the next meeting. So uh, next slide, oh, but you know what, before we go to the next slide, uh, Jim Potts, I think this is probably my favorite of anybody that's taken a picture of uh, 2022 E3 uh, in the club. Uh, just this beautiful picture of the comet as it uh, was probably pretty close to uh, the closest it was to Earth, which was on, what, February 2nd? So next slide. So what's, what's going to happen after ZTF is gone? Well, this is a thing that I've got on my, uh, this is a thing that I've got. This is Sky Safari. And this is Sky Safari when you go into the settings and you disable everything displayed except comets. And when I got Sky Safari and I noticed all these dots moving around and stuff, I was like, what's going on there? And they're comets. So the deal is there's always comets in the sky, and there's a ton of them. It is about 15 minutes until the setting right here on tonight, and that's how many comets are in our sky right now. So we've got 2022 E3 that's uh, right there, pretty close to the zenith. Go ahead and advance the slide. So uh, kind of a cool feature of Sky Safari is the time thing. So I hit the, uh, I hit the button down there, and I hit play. And that's what's going on over time in our sky. We've got so many comets going on, and uh, there's maybe five or six of them that are uh, good enough for big binoculars, small telescopes. Uh, and then it's, you start pushing on them, and it's just, they're all comets. And it's, it's uh, periodic comets, and it's stuff we'll never see again, and more periodic comets, and this goes on forever. But this is just to kind of give you an idea what's going on up there as far as the comet world is concerned. Next slide. So to stay on the theme of comets. Uh, 2022 E3 is still bright. It's still holding it below magnitude 8, which is cool. Uh, it's uh, going to stay in the sky for a while because it's going up uh, uh, relative to our uh, uh, solar system plane. Um, but, uh, you know, according to uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, uh, they actually had a featured article in it for uh, the March issue, and they spoke of other comets that are really looking good for possibly being bright comets, at least binocular comets, possibly maybe even 
naked eye comets again. So we've got 21, uh, 21 T4 uh, that, that maybe by uh, July. You know, I bought this for a collimator. It's a Hotec collimator. I never thought that I'd be using it for a pointer. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a spindy pointer. <laughs> That's right, versatile. So uh, we've got uh, we've got July of this year that uh, we'll be uh, getting getting something uh, brighter with that guy. One hundred three P. Looking at uh, late September. Uh, number two. I've been waiting for Inky to come back. Uh, the last time that Inky was around, uh, I was just getting my telescope and just getting it all figured out. And Inky was gone before I could work it out. So I'm really happy that it's back. Uh, it's going to be uh, coming around again, and uh, mid-October is going to be good for that. And 62P, uh, the same uh, sort of anticipated magnitude for December. And then uh, another comet that we'll probably never see again, 2021S3. 20, uh, but uh, it might be uh, nice and uh, nice and bright. Uh, next uh, next year in uh, 2024 in February. So uh, I, I spoke of this last month. Uh, this is the website that I go to. This is my Bible when it comes to identifying what's going on in the sky. Is that is that guy from Japan who is he's got he's got all sorts of contributors, uh, all sorts of imagers, all sorts of measurement takers, and it's not just about comets. It's about all sorts of stuff, but that comet section on his website is absolutely fundamental as far as I'm concerned to, to, to have information that's actually up to date. There are a lot of comet websites out there that don't really keep up to date. And you got a bunch of last year's data and it's, it's this one's a good one. He, he stays current. Um, by the way, uh, Bruce Campbell took a picture of this. Does it look familiar to you? This is another image of uh, the uh, uh, 2022 E3, it's, uh, it's certainly been something that we've all been wanting to point our uh, cameras and telescopes to. Uh, just, uh, just faded from naked eye, and uh, yeah, I hope everybody got a chance to see it. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a weird comet. So next slide. Okay, so on March 1st, we're going to be getting a conjunction. Um, the uh, Jupiter, Jupiter is about to leave our uh, evening sky, uh, not to be seen again until September. Uh, but uh, as it starts to set, it catches up with Venus, that's an evening star right now, and they'll be getting uh, to a half a degree from each other, uh, which is uh, if you hold your if you hold your hand out and stick your pinky up. That's the width of about half a degree, and that'll cover up the moon just about exactly. Well, it depends on how fat your pinky is, so or skinny your pinky is. But uh, yeah, it'll be half a degree. Uh, I happen to have this Mike Jones, our very own Mike Jones, uh, imaged this. This was the great conjunction in December 2020 with Saturn and Jupiter. And uh, this was one-tenth of a degree. Okay, so that gives you an idea one-tenth of a degree right there, which was extraordinarily rare, the best in like hundreds of years. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get, uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, Jupiter and Venus, we're talking about a couple of, well, the two brightest planets in the sky. So uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be cool to see. So next slide. All right, full moon. It's the crow moon, according to the Native Americans. Uh, it's going to be on Tuesday, March 7th. Next slide. Oh, what's this? So, uh, you know, we had, to, uh, we had to give this a bump. So on 2 p.m. on Saturday, March 18th, and going all day and all night long, we're going to have our opening event uh, out there at Rising Star. Uh, anybody that's not been out to Rising Star, you're going to love it. It's, you, we, we got, I mean, aside from like low trees in certain parts, you've got really as far as 
what's worth seeing is at least 10, 15 degrees up, you've got three, 360 degree horizon, Bortle two skies, it's, it's beautiful out there, it's quiet, and it's just uh, it's a great place to be and, and do our thing. Uh, next slide. Cirrus. So on uh, Tuesday, March 21st, uh, we've got uh, Cirrus. It's going to be the closest to the Earth that it's going to be all year long. Um, I like to do this, but I especially like to do it uh, on this occasion because Cirrus is going through Coma Berenices, and it's close to Leo as well. And what does that mean when these things are in the sky? It means that it's galaxy season. And uh, I, I love galaxy season. And this, this, uh, this area of the sky is absolutely lousy with them. And uh, Cirrus, uh, you know, for, uh, for any um, uh, imaging endeavors or uh, looking through the telescope, uh, there's actually going to be uh, a few uh, occasions around this date uh, where Cirrus is going to be getting very close uh, to uh, some, some pretty cool galaxies, uh, a couple spiral galaxies and stuff. So uh, it's uh, kind, of a, kind of a cool thing. So it's, it's the biggest uh, asteroid, known asteroid in the solar system. Uh, it's the first asteroid to be discovered. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be shining at 6.9 uh, on the night of opposition, and uh, you can see Leo's butt right here. So it's going to be just like right in between Coma Berenices and Leo there. Um, something I didn't know when I put this slide together is that in 2006, the same year that Pluto got its demotion, well, uh, Cirrus got a uh, got a, uh, a change, a reclassification itself, and uh, they were both uh, changed to the status of dwarf planet. So, fun fact. Next slide, please. All right, so on the same night, uh, the new moon uh, happens on March 21st. So that's only, what, three days after our uh, open house, so that makes the open house a pretty good date for that. So pray for no rain. Uh, next slide, please. So, we're at World of Beers, and I'm sitting next to Cy Simonson, and we're having a conversation about the meetings and having a conversation about the, the presentations and stuff, and he was like, you know what you ought to do? You ought to feature Constellation every month. You know, there's somebody that used to do that, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. I've been thinking about that for the last three months, and so... It's always been my plan is that coming up on this, this, uh, this month that uh, I would start doing that. So my formula considers the ideal placement of a constellation where it is somewhere crossing the median, anywhere on the median, okay? So it's the highest in the sky that it's going to be all night long. Two hours after it officially turns night, which is always pretty much about 30 minutes after astronomical twilight when it like truly gets dark the sun's direct line of sight is beyond where light is actually reaching our part of the atmosphere so um yeah so and 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 when it's actually crossing the meridian at that time of night halfway between this meeting and the next one so it's really kind of ideally really okay well, <laughs> okay, here we go. So next slide. All right, so it's Monoceros, the unicorn. And uh, it's the Greek term for unicorn. And uh, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, Petrus Plancius that uh, actually uh, put it. He, he did star globes. He was actually very uh, uh, prolific as far as uh, uh, cartography, star cartography is concerned. And uh, he did globes and he did flat maps. And uh, at the same time that he put Monoceros on the map for the first time, he put Camelopardalus, the giraffe. So it was creature theme. Um, it's not a very bright star. Uh, it's not a very bright uh, constellation. The brightest star is like magnitude 3.9. And uh, 
you will see in the next slide that uh, trying to make out a unicorn by looking at the stars is, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> he's drinking or he just likes unicorns or something. He's going to make this work. We're going to get a unicorn in the sky, people. Let's do this. So next slide. Okay, so this is a map of Monoceros. And we've got all these little doodads in here. There's 61, it's generally 61 deep space objects here. And I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over. I'm sorry. So uh, I hope you all don't mind. Um, so it is, uh, it's the closest black hole to our solar system. And it happens to be in this constellation. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, it's a black hole, so you, know, you can't see it. So I had to make that dot. But that's where it is in the constellation. It's not something you look at, because you can't look at it. But it's something that you know is there. It's a fun fact about Monoceros. It's a crazy one. Uh, it's, it's actually got a, a main sequence companion. And these orbit each other every 7.75 hours. We're talking about two stars that orbit each other in 7.75 hours. Next slide. So this is called V838 Monocerotis. This is a red supergiant. And there are lots of theories about what happened in February 2002. In February of that year, uh, its brightness increased by a factor of 10,000 in one day. And it was such an explosion. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a supernova. But it was extremely bright. It was bright enough that the light that, the, the light that got uh, blocked actually got delayed to actually getting to us. So they, they call that a light echo. And the, uh, the explosion that happened actually lit up the, in first of all, it created this mess of stuff around the star, but uh, it also uh, lit it up. So it was a pretty incredible sight. This is what makes it cooler. Next slide. So Hubble took 11 different pictures of it. And uh, this is six of them, and basically this is the evolution of this. You catch something like this. They think that perhaps it was either two stars in the system that collided, or it was maybe uh, that uh, one of the stars ate a Jupiter-sized planet or something like that to just create such a, a mess here. So uh, anyway, uh, Wikipedia's story on it is absolutely amazing, and it's something worth looking up. You ought to check that out. So next slide, please. The Rosette Nebula, we've all heard about it. Not everybody knows exactly where it is. It's in Monoceros. So it's up here. It's big. OK. Um, it's, uh, it actually has a uh, open cluster in the middle. And it's, uh, it's actually the, the gas that's uh, actually creating that little cluster in there. So this is a little birthplace of stars right here. Um, by the way, this is Matthew Nguyen's picture, so uh, that's, that's uh, it's a, it's a nice picture here, a nice detailed picture of the, the rosette. Next slide. So it's got an apparent magnitude of 9, and like I said, it's big. It's 80 minutes by 60 minutes. Uh, it's definitely something that if you image it, you've got to do a mosaic unless you've got a really wide field scope. But it's, uh, it's a really beautiful uh, piece of work up there. Uh, next slide. Hubble's Variable Nebula. You know, if you didn't know what you were looking at, you'd think you were looking at a comet. Because that's what I thought when I first saw it. And I was like, oh, no, it's not. The cool thing about Hubble's Variable Nebula, which is right here in the constellation, is that there is an obscured star in here. And there is gas and dust that is encircling this star. And the cool thing about this is that that gas and dust, as it's passing in front of this star that you can't see, casts, the, the, the theory, the leading theory is, is that it casts an enormous shadow on the rest of the illuminated gas. So it's part reflection nebula here, and there's still ionization going on. But what happens is, is that that enormous shadow being cast upon this uh, gas and dust is actually the thing that makes it variable in brightness. 
It's a really cool, uh, really cool uh, little item in the sky. Uh, next slide. So this guy's a little bit smaller. It's four minutes by two minutes, but uh, it's, still, uh, it's still pretty cool to see in the eyepiece. Uh, looking at it with a telescope, it's at magnitude nine, and uh, that's what it looks like when it's huge on the side of a wall. Um, next slide, please. Messier 50, this is actually the only Messier object that's in Monoceros. Uh, it was discovered by Charles Messier, of course, and uh, like, like, uh, like the whole uh, finding of the unicorn in the stars that make up Monoceros, well, Charles Messier thought that, it, that this cluster, if you want to go to the next slide, that this cluster is in the shape of a heart. And go ahead and go to the next slide here. If you can see a heart in here, then you can probably see the unicorn too, so good on you. Anyway, this is 14 by 14 minutes. Um, it's brighter at 5.9 magnitude. And uh, yeah, it's just a, a nice, little, uh, nice little gathering of stars there. So next slide, please. So this one's a weird one. So they called this the Red Rectangle Nebula because uh, before the Hubble got to it, they thought that it uh, was rectangular shaped. But when the Hubble got to it, and it's, it's right here, it's very small, okay? Um, when the Hubble got to it, it's shaped more like an X. So if you go to the next slide, check this out. It's beautiful. This is the Hubble shot of this. And these are actually, these are actually ladders. This is different stages of what's coming off of this star. And there are uh, eddies, there are, uh, there's, there are actually vortices that are happening at the end of there. This is how they're figuring out how this X even happened in the first place. So uh, this is another cool one to actually look up online. Uh, go to, go to uh, well, I, I have it later, but uh, you know where to look it up. But it's, uh, it's a really cool one to read about. Um, anyway, it, it is small. It's 40 seconds by 26 seconds. Uh, so you probably see it in the eyepiece as a, as a very small thing, but uh, at least you know about it. Planetary nebula usually are small unless we're talking about the dumbbell anyway. Next slide. So this is the butterfly nebula. Okay, this is right in the middle of Monoceros here, where maybe you'd call that the shoulder or whatever. Uh, it is a, the central star is a spectroscopic binary, which means that they can't see it they only know that there's a binary because of spectroscopy analysis. Um, it's a it's variable star, and um, it's a really pretty it's a really pretty nebula. Go to the next slide, please. So this guy shines at about 11.6 uh, magnitude, and uh, it's about a minute squared, and uh, so it's small. But it, uh, it, it really is a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty nebula in this constellation. Next slide. Then there's the Cone Nebula and Christmas Tree Cluster. These are two different objects that were all given the same designation of uh, NGC 2264. Uh, it's right up here at the top of Monoceros' little territory here. Uh, other objects are actually the Snowflake Cluster and Fox Fur Nebula. Uh, didn't include pictures of those. If you go to the next slide, you can see what we're talking about here. This is Trevor Bray's picture. And uh, we got the little cone right here. And uh, there's the uh, Christmas tree. Uh, I don't even, it's, 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 it might as well be a unicorn in there. I don't see a Christmas tree, but that was the, what they call it. Uh, next slide, please. Seagull Nebula. So this is the big guy down here. Uh, you can see that from a size standpoint, it's almost as big as a, it's about as big as the, the rosette up there. And uh, it's a mission nebula, and uh, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really quite dim, but uh, it's a really pretty nebula, especially if you image it like Jim Potts did here. Uh, next slide. This is Jim Potts' take on it, and uh, it's a really great shot. Uh, magnitude of uh, a little under seven. And it's big. It's 120 minutes by 40 minutes. So uh, definitely, a, definitely a wide shot item. Uh, next slide, please. 
So if you want to know more about Monoceros, um, I, found, I found a place actually on the Sky Live where you can look at a listing of all 61 of the deep sky objects in Monoceros. So it's actually pretty num numer num There's a lot of them. Uh, for, uh, for more about star systems and objects, constellation-guide.com uh, is really cool. It's, uh, obviously, it's, you know, it features any of the constellations, but uh, that's just a really good website and something that I found is a very informative source. Um, for deep dives into any constellation, and if you like stuff like this where it's just like, hey, I may never see this stuff, but I understand what's going on with that star. I understand the theory about its evolution. I understand what's happening up there. Or you can see it, whether you can see it or not. It's the knowing of the stuff. I immensely recommend Annals of the Sky. They're on volume eight right now, waiting for nine to come out. But the first few volumes were co-authored by Dennis Webb, who is a member of our fair club here. So uh, I, would, I would definitely recommend that. And uh, seriously, you gotta, you gotta check out the Red Triangle and V838 uh, online. It's really some cool stuff about what's going on with that. It's lots of violence and that's, that's hot in my book. Uh, next slide. So keep looking up. Uh, this uh, this uh, image right here is uh, uh, Robert Cargill's nice and super deep picture of the Pleiades, M45, and uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> so we'll do some quick announcements and then... Uh, Take a break. Um, Patrick McMahon is uh, leads our outreach program, and John, did we did we we didn't we don't start Tandy until next month, right? Okay, thanks. So, um, just wanted to double check that. Patrick, could you come on up? Okay, I'm going to turn the lights on. So watch your eyes. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, well, I got three star parties scheduled this week. Unfortunately, the weather ain't looking good for any of them, so don't hold your breath on that. So whoever bought whatever, thank you. <laughs> but Okay, thanks. And then I got two next week. Uh, we got one uh, not far from here, uh, Kirkpatrick Element Middle School, which is not far from here. And then on the third, I got one for kind of a Girl Scout type group uh, down at Cleburne State Park. So we'll see what the weather holds on that. And for that, asking about uh, Dinosaur Valley, the first one is March 11th. So hopefully the weather will be good there. And as usual, I'll post these on the e-group as we get closer. So like I said, just uh, if you want to come help out, just reply on the email or just show up. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Joel, do you have anything other than you're good? Okay, uh, Michelle is gonna give us a quick chat on what's going on with the uh, Rising Star Development Committee and uh, she's gonna look exactly like Tom Roth and give his report. All right, um, quick update on Quick update on uh, Rising Star. We had a uh, group meeting. Excuse me, somebody's remote. Um, we had a meeting last night. Um, for the most part, our priorities have remained the same. Uh, we were out there on Saturday, uh, got the posts set for the um, gate. The gate was delivered. Uh, it's been dry fit, it's been measured, and it's just a matter of we had to let the cement set before we could attach the gate. And I believe they're going to be working on that this weekend. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
this past weekend we had like nine to ten people. We were out there digging cactus. We were digging mesquite trees, little tiny ones, not not big ones for the most part. But but we were clearing the field, and then uh, Cole and Amaya brought their riding lawnmower, and they have mowed the field, and it looks fantastic. So uh, it, it very very grateful for for them to be doing that for us. Um, I know this coming Saturday there will be people out there also. Is that correct, Bruce? Um, that's correct. Okay. The work on gate mm -hmm. and then also uh, the construction of the handrails okay. the ramp, the landing next to the, the Okay. So they'll be working on the gate and the uh, handrails for the porch area. Yes. It's going to be, it is 15 feet, 7 inches. It's about 16 feet, just the same as the gate we've been going through. So. Okay, I'm a little bit confused because uh, I've been out there a couple times during the day. There's, uh, uh, there's like two fences. Okay. Right. The, the, the entry, the physical entry onto the property is 19 feet wide. And then the gate, the actual gate is 16 feet. You're thinking about the little two posts where you come in the gate and then you drive into the actual observing field? Is that your question? I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. So, uh, so this new gate is being installed where again? At the road. At the road. Okay, this is at the road. And not. Oh, yeah, because you're getting a new entrance to the road. Yeah, okay. Correct. It's the, entry, it's the entryway to the property. Oh, okay. And this has been designed um, so that you're not on the road, turning in, half in and half out of the road with your vehicle while you get out to open the gate. It's, it's in, I'm not sure how far the county will pour, but you'll be going into the site so there will be plenty of room for your vehicle to be off of the road while you get out and open up the gate. So that was very good planning. Yeah, off the, off the county road to the actual physical gate is about 50 feet. 50, 50 feet from road to the gate, so there's plenty of room, which I think is a great safety uh, item for those of us who, you know, especially since we've got that curve that prevents anybody from, from seeing you or not seeing you and then hitting you as you're waiting to open up the gate. Um, we still will have to figure out and how we're going to serpentine the road, which trees to take out to get a road to the observing area. Until that point in time, for, my understanding is for the picnic, we'll just sort of be coming in our gate and then sort of doing a little turn into the observing site uh, for the next little while. But one of our next priorities then is to get the actual road distinguished to get us to the observing site and so it will serpentine in it won't be straight in because we want to maintain all of those lovely mesquite trees and other items that are shielding our observing site from the road that keeps people from seeing our storage sheds that keeps people obviously the light glare any that would come through but it's just a good way to shield the property <coughs> excuse me um, so we will be working on that, and uh, I believe one of the items they're going to try to do this weekend is to just look and scout as to where the actual storage shed will be placed, because it will be a larger building, and that is also uh, next up on the list as far as items to take care of. We have not looked at total cost on that, so all of that is still under discussion. Um, but that, that, that's the direction we're moving right now. And all of the volunteers who've come out to help for all of it, we thank you very much. Uh, any questions on Rising Star before I move on to Palo Pinto? Mm 
Okay. And, and with any luck, the, as you're going in, the right post, we're going to cut it down. But we're not quite there yet. Right. Do you have padlocks and stuff now? Is there padlocks on the gates and stuff? Like the gate has not been installed. When it's installed, I'm assuming we'll simply move the lock from the, what's, where it is on James Ross's property to our gate. It should be the same lock, same combination uh, on the group IOS site. Do you want me to broadcast the code to everybody? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Um, anything else? Oh, and I'm, you know, because we do have groups coming out for the March 18th picnic, we will probably be calling and asking for some volunteers to help guide people who are new to the site or public who've never been there to sort of get them through the gate and around and through so that they don't start wandering onto James Ross's property and meeting with their chickens and turkeys and all of that good stuff. So, yes. Does the gate swing into the field or towards the road? Both. It will be easier, I think, to swing into the field simply because of the grading it is right now. Well, it, but it, it, yeah. It's designed to go both ways. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, Paolo, Pen and any time you have questions, you can always email the Rising Star Development Group off of the IOS site uh, because that does come to every member that's on the development committee. For Rising Star. Um, Palo Pinto Mountains State Park. We are actually members of the, of the partners. Uh, many of you are individual members. We also have, a believe, a membership as a club. Um, things are currently working. We had a meeting in January. We've already been updated on that. Uh, plans are still to open this year. Um, those of you who are actual individual members, you have probably gotten an email asking for volunteer time. Uh, currently, the uh, State Park Partners is working as volunteers to help clear the trails that are being developed in the park. So um, I know Tom and I, at least, have made a presence, and he's trying to volunteer every week if he can possibly do that, because uh, they're going out in groups of four six days a week to do this, and it's going to continue for several weeks. There's a lot of trails. Um, I would warn you, if you do want to volunteer, it is not easy work. Uh, it's very physical, but it is only for about four hours at a time. Um, but uh, that's where we're at now. But again, we're working so that we, as an astronomy group, have a presence with the people who are constantly in strong, you know, the rangers, the superintendent, uh, the people who are on the partner's board, uh, because you've got, you've got all different groups who want to use the club or to use the park, so, you know, they are working with the bird watchers and the mountain bikers and the equestrian groups, and they are going to be working with us as, as astronomy. I know that uh, uh, we spoke with them um, at one of the meetings about the possibility of putting red lights at the pavilion as a separate circuit. Um, I know they're going to be doing, I think it's blue lights uh, up near the pier, the fishing pier for the fishermen. So we're asking them to look at the possibility of putting in those red lights around the pavilion, which is where they're going to um, have their basic area for astronomy and star parties when we start holding those. Uh, but yeah, we are continuing to make our presence known so that they know, as astronomers, we are interested in using their site and helping them to maintain it as a dark sky site. Um, any questions on Palo Pinto? So if you want to volunteer, how do you do that? First, you have to be a member of the State Park Partners, so you would have to become a member. And um, then you can, ju you can just uh, volunteer. They'll send you an email. And they just basically open it up a um, couple of weeks at a time and ask for volunteers. Are you currently a member? Okay. I will um, get the information to you to sign up if you want to do that. It's, I think individual memberships right now are $25 for a year. So it's not an expensive organization to, to work on, but, um, but it's, it's fulfilling. It's, it's going to be a great partnership with them.
Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, hope the legal beagle Sai is going to give us a chat. We're working on bylaws, and um, and it's important uh, for us to get this uh, squared away so we get our tax exemption uh, on property tax and uh, and the other. There's two issues. There's or getting a property tax exemption and then the, at the state level. I'll let Sai explain it. And um, but we're following a process. The bylaws, the new bylaws, will be published in prime focus for March, and we will have a vote on the new bylaws in April at the April meeting. Do we have a copy of the changes? No. Yes. There's a word document. Oh, he's looking for that. So. The form that we got to fill out to get uh, the property tax exemption, which is both the uh, real property and the property, um, like our telescopes, um, personal property, they got certain language we got to meet. So we changed the bylaws to meet all that language. And we also looked at our uh, 501c3 filing with the IRS to make sure that it coincided with everything. So we'll be good. We're just going to go through the bylaws real quickly. We're going to publish them in the uh, in the uh, prime focus, and that meets our bylaw uh, requirement for you guys to have 30 days to look at them before we vote on, on them in April. No luck. I'm sorry, no? Okay, can't find them. So anyway, we'll have them, I'll, I'll go through a couple quick things. So we made some changes. So when we did the home, uh, hold harmless agreement, some of the language in the bylaws was talking about code of conduct and all that, so some of the language is changing on that. We don't call them dark sky sites anymore, we're calling them observer areas, so a lot of language changes is on that. Um, there we go, pull it on up. Just roll up to the first page, do, 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 hopefully. Okay, so um, just putting in word public because we're a public entity, that's a little change there. You can go on up some more. Do, 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 do. Uh, ah, just change that to the to the right um, to the right name. What we have for that next page. Keep going up slowly. Keep going. Ah, just something I added. Part of the benefits we have access to our I/O groups. Just so people know. I don't see them. They're kind of disappearing. Should be a bunch of red in there somewhere. Hmm. Added a couple things. This was added. I know we didn't have the four open directors before. Go back to the first page. There was one one change on the first page too. I'm sorry. On the first page, it actually had said that. Uh, keep going down. Oh, sorry. Up a little bit more. Do, 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 do. Change this. Um, to say that we're recognized as a 501c3. It also in there add the. Uh, it was said that we were part of the Astro League, which didn't mean anything, so I took that out. And keep going down, down, down. Ah. So it's part of Secretary's duties, but we kind of pulled that away from her so other people could help with that, so the Secretary doesn't, doesn't have all that. So we, we designated somebody else to uh, assist in the inventory stuff, and currently I have that job. Uh, we don't want to overwhelm her. Or the secretary. Do, 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 do. Just a word change there, code conduct. Um, part of the language you had to stick in our bylaws was we have to include any land that we may own. This is a new thing. So uh, we're going to add that in there because we didn't own any land till now. Well, we did, but we got rid of it. We sold it down in, on South. Next. Ah, so this is all added. This, this mainly says it's for public use, and if we ever get rid of the land, we have to give it to somebody, so we decide we're going to give it to Noble Planetarium, but if they don't want it, then we'll sell it. If they don't want the money, then we've got to five, find a 501C, and that's all the language that's on the form that we've got to fill out. So that's what that is. So I added that whole part there. And the last one is just indemnification if uh, some of the board members do something bad. And in the last page, this just lists all our changes. And on the very bottom, this is the 
essentially what it's going to be. Keep going, keep going. So we made some corrections. We changed some, some language. We changed some verbiage. Um, did a little bit of minor language to better, better define some sections and up a little bit more, I think. Maybe not. So that just lists everything we had done. Yeah. Something that may confuse okay, let's talk about um, what we say were uh, the Tarrant County, Eastland County. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that one. Was um, up there, it said that we operate, it said uh, Tarrant County before. We had put Eastland County in there because Eastland County is now where our land is. Um, and, it's, and the language says we operate in and around Tarrant County and Eastland County. So that'll count us when we go down to the Thompson Observatory. So rather than list all the places, we just sit in and around those two counties. Other questions? So we'll have this published in the Prime Focus. George will have that out in the next couple weeks. And that'll give us the, the 30 days um, to look at it and such before we vote on it at the April. April? At the April um, April board, yes. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I think it's just be an A or an A, I or an A, right? Yeah. So we'll be we'll be hearing go. Any any discussion on it? Do we need to change anything? All in favor, say aye. So if you got some comments, please comment on them. So um, the boards looked through them twice. I think we covered most of the things we thought. But we may miss something. Other questions? The, the question was. Oh, yeah. You know, the question was if we vote individually or if we vote on the thing as a whole. And we're going to try and vote on it as a whole. But people have questions. That's why we're publishing it. So we can kind of discuss it at the next meeting. Other questions? Yes. Well, it's been a long, it's one of those things where you work on it for a while and you gotta leave it alone. And you look at something else and go, oh, that didn't make any sense. So yeah, it's been nine months, but I think we got it. Other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Cy. Um, I'm gonna make two quick announcements and then, then we'll take a break, maybe seven minutes. So um, we received um, a letter from Palo Pinto Mountain State Park uh, thanking us for re renewing our subscription with them. So we have a letter and we have a, a sticker. I suppose it's supposed to go on a vehicle, but since we don't own a vehicle, we'll just keep the sticker. And then... Um, <laughs> we uh, recently did a... Um, event at Lamar Middle School and we got a very nice thank you card from them. Again, uh, thanks to Patrick and, and John that uh, they do a hell of a lot of work um, on these events. Uh, if, if you've not been out to help out, um, it's, it's, it is a, it's a heck of a lot of work. Last year we had almost 8,000 people um, one of the events had something like 3,000, so it is a lot of work, and it's important work for us. So, um, so why don't we take about a seven-minute break, and then we'll come back and learn about Mr. Messier. Yeah, oh, so don't forget the raffle tickets for us now, which are a dollar, a dollar a pop. And if you haven't bought raffle tickets for the open house, please do so. All right, we'll be back in about seven minutes.
Well, as soon as Chris gets back, we'll get started again. Okay, so while we're waiting for Chris to come, oh, while we're waiting for Chris to get back, I've been looking at the questions here. So um, if you want to buy tickets online, um, we can use Zelle, or um, if you're going to be at the event, you can buy them at the event. I, I am yelling as loud as I can into the microphone. So, um, if you want to buy tickets uh, online, or not online, but we can use Zelle um, to accept payment, and each ticket has its own unique number, so we can do it that way. Or uh, if you're coming to the event, you can purchase uh, the raffles up until, I think, 4.30, and we'll, we'll get into that schedule a little bit later. Um, or if, if you're willing to bribe me and meet me at Starbucks somewhere, I'll, I'll bring the tickets to you. So anyway, um, that's how we can do the tickets. I'm sure we can get the Zell details from John um, at the appropriate time. So let's see here. Any other questions online before we move into Mr. Messier? Okay, so um, so in in the announcements, clear uh, we don't really have much to say about the open house at this moment in time, but we will be getting into it very soon. Um, again, it's March the eighteenth. It's Saturday, um, and the, as uh, Bill pointed out, it's three days from uh, a new moon, but we'll have total darkness because the moon set sets very, very early um, on the day. And the backup date, uh, whether or not participating with us would be the 25th of March. So, okay. So I'm gonna talk about Charles Messier, the man, the myth, and the marathon. I've always wanted to do a Messier marathon. I've been to them. Uh, Matt Reed, who's not here this evening, used to run them. Or the last one I went to, I believe he ran out at Thompson, the old Thompson, when we had a pretty good youth group. Um, it, it, was, it was very interesting to see how that uh, was run. But Charles Messier, who was born in June of 1730 and died in 1817 of a stroke, uh, or complications of a stroke, um, was uh, he is a French astronomer who uh, collated a list of nebulae and and bright and and objects 
that uh, could be confused with comets. He was originally work. He actually spent most of his time working for the French Navy, and um, that was his job was to find comets. Uh, and uh, so, one thing I found very interesting: if you if you follow world history, there's there's really not a whole lot of love lost between the French and the English. And it's very interesting that amongst the many accolades that Messier received is uh, he was named member of the Royal Society before the French Academy of Sciences thought to enlist him into their organization. He was also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy and uh, King Louis XV uh, titled him the Ferret of Comets because that's all he did was to find comets. So um, uh, some of the many different telescopes, and that, now this is something I find very interesting. Um, you know, we talk about our telescopes, their focal lengths of a thousand millimeters and, you know, eight, eight inch objectives, okay? So, um, Messier used telescopes whose focal lengths were measured in feet, like 32 feet, 19 feet. A short telescope, six feet, okay? Pretty interesting. And the mirrors, if, if, uh, if we recall, and I think we talked about this last year sometime when we talked about Newtonians, that the mirrors and the reflectors were kind of mad, but they were made out of speculum metal. So when you think about um, what they were able to accomplish with these devices, it's pretty, pretty damn amazing. So um, and as I mentioned, uh, Messier's favorite scope was uh, a 32-foot telescope, seven and a half inch aperture, magnification. I think that's supposed to be 140. Um, but they they did they did some computations, and the effective aperture was three and a half inches. So you can imagine the challenge that he had, or any of the astronomers of the day had, when viewing. They had huge A-frames, and and the Lord only knows how they were able to. Uh, to move the, th the scopes. So, um, so those are the challenges that he had. Next slide, please. So it's, what, this is what I find ama amazing about when we look at the carto cart cartography of the time, whether it's astronomical or if you look at uh, maps that the cartog cartographers of the day did of, say, like the United States. How bloody accurate they are, and how did they do that? Because they walked the country and shot stars. That's, that's how they did it. It's pretty amazing. So this is the Orion Nebula, as Messier found it in March of 1774. So just, just remember that, okay? So again, he was employed by the French Navy. Um, he, uh, to essentially find comets, he discovered 12 and shared the discovery of two others. Some people claim that uh, he discovered 13. Um, my research indicates that he discovered 12 and he shared the discovery of two others. Um, again, he was crowned. That's duplicate bullet there. I guess I was looking to add more words. So during his searches for comets, Messier came across diffuse objects that were often mistaken for comets. So the Messier object list was born. In 1774, that's the first edition of his list, there were a total of 40, 
five Messier objects. That list grew as time grew, as time went forward. In 1780, there was a total of 80 of them. And just about the time that um, he finished the last catalog of his lifetime, in 1784, there were 103. And finally, in 1967, the last three objects were added to the list, and I think in the 1820s, or maybe the 1920s, I can't remember exactly, there were um, additional, there were three other objects that were, or four other objects that were found. So, um, and there's some history about that, which is why we, I, we have the myth. A lot of people, the common perception is that Messier found all of the objects in this, in his list, and he didn't. He worked, um, what he had a colleague, um, I cannot pronounce his name, that he worked with that found um, uh, 25 or so of the first 45 Messier objects. And um, in the day, if you worked for the chief astronomer, you didn't necessarily get the credit um, you know, it's kind of like today. You, you work for a company, you get a, you get issued a patent. They pay you a dollar, and it's theirs. So, so that's how um, the list became as large as it is. To, uh, the next slide, please. So that's that's why that's the myth part of it. Um, so in 1967, when they added the the final objects to the list. It, it turns out through research, they found the people that thought they found these objects learned that Messier or someone on his team found the objects. So they figured, and I think rightly so, that they should be in the, op, in the, the catalog. So this is an image of M42. I'm going to turn the lights off for just a sec here. So here's an image of M42, uh, M42 that I took last year. And, um, you know, it's, I, I took this, I believe, yeah, on, on my Red Cat 51, 250, mil, 250 millimeter scope. And um, so the detail that we get today with our relatively, our small scopes, um, is is quite phenomenal. I, I could only imagine what Messier and his colleagues would think if, if they had the equipment that we have today. So um, I, I just I just find it absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I and I, now I wish I had a slide with both um, my object and Messier's object. But if you look at this, it's you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Chris, can you go back one slide for me? It's, it's pretty, when you consider that he drew this by hand, it's pretty accurate. Using the technology that he had, he probably looked at this through his Newtonian scope with the speculum, with, which is basically a pseudo-polished piece of metal in you know, what he was able to, to derive out of that. And all of the drawings in this catalogs are similar. And I just, it's phenomenal. And um, so next slide, please. So, <clears throat> so today, uh, what a lot of people are doing, it's a, it's a annual kind of event, is um, have Messier marathons, which are attempts to find as many objects as possible of the, and, of the 110 in one night. Now, some, the, way thing, the way some people try to do it all by themselves and other folks do it where more systematically where you have four or five or six telescopes and you follow a track. And some folks think that's really not a marathon. Well, I, it's, I, d I would definitely disagree with that. So um, Messier marathons are traditionally run in the March-April time frame. 
and for, tw uh, for 2023, the best date is March 18th. And how do I know this? That website has the best Messier marathon dates for about the next 100 years. So <laughs> coincidentally, it's the same night as the open house. So next slide, please. Um, and we're going to chat about that in just a second. So I grabbed this off of Astro Bin for, for the imagers and, and, or, or for anybody else. Astro Bin is, a, is a, a place where imagers stash um, and publish their images. And this fellow, um, Gary M., created this uh, uh, collage of all the Messier objects. So um, it's 110 of them, and it's quite a lot. And the sizes are relative, so all the, um, the scale is the same. OK, next slide, please. So the marathon. We're going to have our open house again on March 18th. Uh, fallback date is March the 25th. The gates are going to open at 2. People come in and register. We're going to have solar uh, scopes out. And um, we're going to start the, the actual picnic and, and presentation and all that other stuff at, uh, at 4 o'clock. And uh, so we're going to have a picnic. The development committee is going to present on what we're, what we're going to do in the future and how we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to have at least three raffles. Can, can, you, can you hold your questions, please? Um, so the, the, the grand prize raffle, and, and I really appreciate Brandon Hamill for doing this is going to be an evening with the traveling astronomer. Brandon Hamill is an outstanding, um, very, very well-known visual observer. And um, so the grand prize will be uh, an observing event with Brandon. So if I wanted to win, that would be one. I would en enjoy spending time with Brandon. It's just he's a really cool guy. Um, we're going to have lots of observing activities. And hopefully, lots of fun. It's, of course, open to club members. Uh, we've sent invitations out to Cisco, Cross Plains, and Rising Star, and HEB school districts. Um, HEB, simply because I live there, and I know the school board president and a lot of people that are on the board there. I would be surprised if anybody comes from HEB. But Cisco, Cross Plains, and Rising Star are very close to uh, rising to our observing area. And um, it's an opportunity for us to really expand our outreach. Um, we haven't invited, but I, I, th I would like to invite Ranger and Gorman school districts. They're very close. They're small. Um, and uh, and maybe Brownwood. Again, it's, uh, I want to um, uh, expand our outreach. And it's, to me, it's an opportunity to get more folks to join. So, but before I did that, I kind of would like to hear what you all have to say. Um, the club is going to provide hamburgers, hot dogs, and water. And um, we're going to ask folks to bring potluck sides. Can we have the next slide, please? So Bill has, has produced an outstanding brochure that's going to describe what we're up to and how to, how to sign up and, and all that kind of stuff. We have to, we're going to tweak it a little bit tonight, and it's going to go out tomorrow. It will have a link um, for... Uh, the RSVP, the questionnaire, and uh, that's how we hope everybody will, will register. 
And um, the announcement's going to be delivered through e-groups. And the reason for that is um, I think e-groups is a little broader, but more importantly, Night Sky Network, Night Sky Network doesn't allow us due to attachments. John's back there shaking his head. And then how the heck are we going to deliver the brochure? The, the brochure is what we need to send out, John. No, we were going to email the brochure. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll figure this out. There will be an email going out before 6 o'clock tomorrow morning with, with how to get the, the brochure. Okay? So um, we are gonna, we're sponsored in part by Explorer Scientific. Boy, I, I cannot type with a hit. It's supposed to be, exp oh, that is spelled right, Explore Scientific. Um, they have donated a National Geographic uh, telescope for us to use in the raffle. And um, Starizona, um, which is a pretty popular uh, astronomy store in Arizona. And uh, they have uh, sent us a pretty hefty library of, of books. It's, I want to say, 10 or 11. Um, they are geared towards very young astronomers to very older, to older astronomers. So we're going to figure out how to use those um, uh, as part of the raffle. And I, I did have a very promising conversation with uh, High Point Scientific today. So hopefully they'll be participating with us. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, our proposed schedule for the event. I, I think I mentioned um, we'll open the gates at 2. Um, and we have an end time just to calculate stuff. So we'll have solar viewing from 2 until 6.30. Um, we've got a... Um, three folks that have, have signed up to help us do that. And then we'll have our picnic and presentation from 4 to 6.45 or so. Um, you know, just typical stuff, welcome, introduction. We'll have, a raffle, we'll have raffles going on throughout. And uh, we're going to have five breakout areas. We're going to do a, a mini marathon. And that's for folks who aren't diehard marathoners. Um, so that they'll be able to see uh, all of the, the objects and maybe some uh, non-Messier Marathon objects before around midnight. Matt Reed's going to lead that for us. Uh, then we're going to have um, electronically assisted uh, astronomy. Uh, or Ravi V is going to do that. I cannot pronounce his last name, so he is, he's going to lead that. And I think we'll need a, a couple more folks. Uh, we'll have uh, an imaging demo. So we'll need a couple of imagers for that. And we'll have the full marathon. And I look at, I think we're looking for someone to help lead that subgroup. And, um, uh, and then Bill brought up the, the Crescent Moonrise. So uh, we may have an opportunity to see that. So. So that's, that's the general uh, schedule for, for the open house event. Next slide, please. Okay, so to, to ensure success, um, we're going to need help, okay? Uh, so, you know, we're going to need folding chairs and tables. We're going to need potluck sides. Again, in, in the questionnaire, there'll, 
be an opportunity for for um, everybody, for those that are interested to say what kind of potluck side they'll want to bring. Um, Michelle brought up traffic coordinators earlier. Um, we'll, we'll need help not only for those coming in, but for those leaving. I think the challenge is going to be more for those leaving. So, um, and I, I'm, I've spoken with the Ross family. We may be able to park on that, that north side. So that might make things a little easier for us. Um, again, some of the stations that I talked about. And um, it's not a, we're looking to get some internet access. Um, so if you have Starlink or some other satellite uh, with inter internet access, we'd be interested to see, we're, we're trying to get that because if, if we can get that, Chris has offered um, to uh, actually broadcast what we're doing live out on the internet, which I think is a, another opportunity to reach folks. Um, we, Chris and I and, and Bill were talking about power and whatever that those needs are, and I think we can quickly figure that part out, but without internet, it's kind of a moot point. So um, if you want to help, send an email to outreach at fortworthastro.com. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, go back one slide. Thank you. Question, you if questions are, now's a good time for questions. You, you had one over here. <laughs> okay, that, that's a good catch. We need to not use that phrase because we don't spring forward or fall back. That, that is, that's an outstanding catch. So, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. I can't see you, so I can't figure out who's. Okay. We're going to have multiple. Yeah. yeah. So the, the question or the concern is doing a Messier marathon with a line of people. We're going to have at least four, at least five stations. So, and we really, we don't know, um, we don't know how many club members are going to be there. We don't know how many uh, public members are going to be there. And we'll just have to, the, to do the best we can. Um, I don't think we're going to have thousands of people there. Uh, a, the school districts in question are pretty small, and um, the towns are pretty small. So, you know, if we get 50 total, I'd be I'd be jumping for joy. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, it's a it's it's a valid concern. I'm not I'm not saying that it's not, but um, if let me put it to you this way: if we have that problem, we're having a good night. That's a good problem to solve. Any other questions? Yes, Robin. I'm sorry. When you fill out the questionnaire, you're going to say how many people are you bringing? When the, you get the brochure, it'll have a link that takes you right to it. Yep. Matt. Electronically assisted astronomy. I, and Bill caught me out on this um, the other day. Um, I, I, I use buzzwords whenever I can. So EAA stands for Electronically Assisted Astronomy. And all that is is um, uh, imaging and stacking the images immediately. So you can look at them on a monitor. Yeah. OK. Uh, any other questions? Any questions from online?
the sign is probably going to be installed this weekend. Is it, do I understand that question properly? Uh, I've already spoken to them. I've already spoken to Stephenville, Tarleton, Southwest uh, Adventist, um, Abilene Christian. Uh, so, uh, and um, uh, we are, we are going to have an article published in the Eastland County Today newspaper. It's a weekly. So, um, Yeah, I don't know where it is. In a, and what's really bad is, not only do I not know where it is, I'm, the banner, not, not only do I not know where it is, uh, there's a photograph of me right next to it. So I know we've got it. I'm sorry? John Dowling. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think we need to make one, but um, I, we do have a permanent sign that's going to be hopefully installed next week. But we, Bruce and I have to check the boundary line because where we want to have it or where it's been suggested to have it, we may not be able to put it there. So I don't see why not, Steve. You want to be the, the leader of that group? Pin drop. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if I want to be the leader of the group, but I would <laughs> like to suggest that I give my town of uh, uh, Lake Lenmore a little bit of a year ago on my own uh, with my field of donuts uh, and my videos and money and all that, and got almost all of them in town. Right. Yeah. You're, we would love for you to do it. All in favor? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. So do you mind if I speak for a moment? Can we... Yes, and we'll probably have someone, while you're busy running the scope, someone will be right there saying, this is M42, this is what it is. So, um, but since we're on a time crunch, can we talk about the details at another time? Yep. Uh, I thought I saw a hand raised back in the back. Me. Chris. Okay, uh, real fast. So um, for the regular Mezzi Marathon, because it goes all night and you have 110 objects, you have eight minutes per object. Fortunately, because some of them are grouped together, you can kind of do three or four or two or three at once, especially when you hit the, um, uh, some of the galaxies, like Leo's triplet. Uh, my plan was to do a broadcast whether it's going to be from the uh, our dark sky side or whether it's going to be from Grandview, if the weather holds, I'm going to go ahead and do a broadcast. If I do it from Grandview, um, because we don't have internet out there, I would like if someone could please help me. I'll have enough scopes. I'll have laptops. Just I don't want to spend 11 hours talking to myself. Okay, <laughs> my throat will be sore and I will bore myself and everybody else. Uh, if we do it at Rising Star, I have a pop-up canopy. Um, I would like to use that. I've got sidewalls to block out light. Uh, we can have a television, like a small TV or an extra monitor. I have plenty of cables. I can duplicate the image. 
so that screen can be out. Everyone can see what's going on. The idea is that we have eight minutes to image. With the Hyperstar, I can do, uh, on the Club C11, I can get images faster. Uh, we can do 30 second exposures, we can show off the object, we can talk about it, uh, people online can see, people there can see, and just just start talking about it, and then go on to the next object, the next object, the next object. Uh, there is like, at about 2 a.m. or so, there's a lull of about two hours before the next one comes up uh, over the horizon, so we can spend a little bit more than eight minutes on an object, especially once we hit like Leo's triplet and, and you know the doubles. Um, but on average, it's eight minutes. So that's what you have to remember as you're doing EAA. If you want to capture them, if you want to talk about them, limit yourself to about eight minutes per object. And for some of them, it's like, okay, it's a, it's a binary. Great, two stars. And you can be done within about a minute to two minutes. There's not much to show. For some of them, we need a little bit more imaging. Uh, if we're doing live stacking, then again, it takes a little bit more time. But that's the plan. Um, so again, if someone can please help me on a broadcast, uh, I can handle um, I can handle two additional people with their telescopes and laptops. I can't do um, the Acer Airs. I, I I just can't because those do not have outputs. If you have a laptop with an HDMI output, I'll put a camera on you. I'll put a microphone on you. I will put a, uh, um, and I'll suck in your feed from your laptop. And I can switch between them. So one person can, or two people can be searching. One person can be uh, imaging and talking about their image while the others are, d are going to a different object. We can get a list. We can plan it. There are lists for the Mer uh, Messier Marathon from um, sunset to sunrise on which object you pick. Uh, and it goes logically, so whenever stuff is grouped, it's one to the next, and then you jump over to a different one. So the lists are good, the plan is good, it's all doable. I just need some help. So anyone oh. online, anyone, and honestly, if, if you're somewhere else, we can do a Zoom session, and you can do it remotely from your thing, and we can, your, your site, and we can jump between places. So uh, Chris, all that I, is I feasible. don't want to cut you off, Chris, but we are... <coughs> 13 no, minutes done. from end of meeting. Um, yes, John. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to end this discussion. And we're going to come back. Well, w there will be future meetings about this be between now and the 18th. So you'll see meeting invites. And, and as you, you join or send your queries in, uh, um, I, th I think it's going to be a great event. So. Um, Moving on to the business. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want to forget the raffle. So I'm going to do the raffle real quick, then we'll move into the business meeting. So. Canopies. Lights. Yeah. Right. Well, we're not going to purchase that one. Two nine five zero five zero six. Yes, sir. Two nine five zero four six two. Last but not least, two nine five zero four seven eight. Okay, we're going to ask our esteemed treasurer, who were begging to not retire on the May, on May in May to we're going to ask our esteemed treasurer who were begging not to retire in May 
I'll give you as many zeros before the decimal point as you want. Okay, well, um, let me pull this up real quick. Am I on? I can't. I can't hear me either. Hello? There. Um, da, 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 da. Just bear with me a minute till I get over to that document, and then we'll wrap this up quickly. Um, <coughs> yes, I know, but I can't see that far. Somebody had mentioned, uh, I think, at the last meeting that Amazon Smile was not functioning anymore. But that doesn't appear to be the case because they sent us a check for $70. Is that what it is? Okay. All right. Thank you. We, I'd never got notified it was stopping. Beats me. Um, those numbers up there are current except for a, a $641 expense uh, check for the uh, Rising Star Observing Area, era, er, area uh, Gate Project. Um, we do have a rather large check coming out uh, next month, a uh, middle of next month uh, for insurance. Uh, we are up to 182 people, which uh, is pretty close to um, if you'll scroll up a little bit there, Chris. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> you know what? It scrolls on mine. Why doesn't it scroll? <laughs> you know what? Yeah, Edge is. Um... Well, the the membership um, curve is almost where we are, where we were last year. So we're on 182 now. And I think we ended up at 186 uh, last year. Um, I don't have any other outstanding projects going on personally right now, except for trying to get the membership changed from a fiscal year basis to a calendar year basis. So uh, any, any questions for the treasurer? Nada, that works for me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, is George is George Lutch still online? Okay. George Lutch um, has graciously volunteered to be our new webmaster. Damn, he looks good in that picture. So, uh, so um, he is he is working to migrate our website onto. Uh, Google Workplace. So I'll ask George to chat about what he's up to and what the plan is. site as far as uh, JPEGs, GIFs, anything they had on there, um, and uh, just, uh, you know, reverse engineered it and put it out there on the site. The, it was a one-to-one, -one, and I cleaned up some of the stuff that was outdated as I was moving it across. All the links on it currently point to stuff on its, uh, its own page rather than back to the old page. 
uh, I went through and, and verified all the links, or I hope I've got all the links. I need I need second and third set of eyes to go out there and, and do it. John did a cursory and uh, found quite a few uh, things that I had missed, so I went back and checked it after that. Um, but yeah, um, as far as webmaster, I can I can do all the stuff that you need as far as putting stuff out there, but I don't do much creation. So if we've got anybody in our group that is a graphics designer or a, a web developer that you know doesn't mind giving me ideas uh, or or you know showing me stuff, uh, I would more than be willing to listen. This is sites.google.com, so. Uh, if we've got anybody out there that just wants to take a look at it and uh, kib it, let me know. Uh, send me a send me an email at glutch at gmail dot com, and uh, I will uh, I will go out there and uh, give you access to it. Thank you oh, very much. One more thing, one more thing. I'm not not relating to the website, but uh, something I found out there that I wasn't sure. Uh, if I was taking care of things or not, the uh, there is a oh, what is it? Uh, Astrospheric. That's what I was looking for. Um, Astrospheric has a deal, and I, every now and then I'll publish the the code that you need to actually add yourself to our group on Astrospheric. So uh, if you've gotten that done. And it still hasn't let you in, but it sends me, uh, I think it's been sending me some kind of validation uh, notice on there. If you wouldn't mind following up uh, when you when you join that, if it's not letting you in, uh, by sending me an email with your email address that you're using on there so that I can, uh, you know, kind of cross-reference it and, and allow you to get in there. I don't normally let people that just ask for it via the Astrospheric app, and I've had quite a few of those in the past uh, join it. So I need some uh, corroboration that, hey, I'm part of the club, and this is my email address that I'm actually asking for uh, access to it. Thank you very much, George. Yes. Sure thing. Yes. FortWorthAstro.com. That's the current website. And when when we go through this process, um, uh, when everything's finished with the new site, it's going to be the same website. So. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, not only that, he regenerated himself. He looks just, <laughs> or rejuvenated himself. I'm thinking about the movie Cocoon, and there's a guy said, I want to know how you rejuvenated yourself. Yeah. So. Zoom has a new uh, feature that you can actually create yourself uh, an icon or a, a whatever they call those things, you know, where you've got a virtual you. You're looking good, George. Oh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions in the audience here or online? Oh, there was a flash vote during the break on the penalty for going over on your presentation. And, and that penalty is buying the first round at the World of Beer which is the next activity, folks. So if there's no, if there are no other questions online, any questions here? Yes, Robert. Second, all right. Everybody, thank you very much for attending. Have a great evening and uh, look forward to seeing uh, everybody signing up for the open house. Have a great one. Thank you.